people. And if you've been here any number of times since then, you've heard me make statements about loving our children, loving our children, and of course, our teens, our young adults, they are children. Now, gentlemen, young gentlemen, we have a men's conference that's coming next weekend, Friday night and Saturday. You see what I have in my hand here? This is two $20 bills. Two 20 bucks, two $20 bills. They look very similar to one another, so neither of them are counterfeit, I'm gonna assume. Now, we, we as many of the men in the church, and the church are inviting all of our young men, high school, junior and senior high, at North Star Christian Academy, our young uh, men at junior high, senior high, and our merge young men, up to 25 years old, all our single, we're inviting you to come to the men's conference for free. Now, it normally costs $40. I'm paying 40 bucks. In fact, I'm bringing four other people with me. It's costing me $200 to come to the conference. Now, young men, we are offering this to you. Tim Lee, Tim Lee is a great youth speaker, and I, can, and I can prove that because he's one of the few people that they will have speak to the crowd at Liberty University of 10,000 young people. Tim Lee knows how to connect with young people. He's a Vietnam vet, lost both of his legs in the Vietnam War. He's a power, powerful speaker gains respect from any audience that he speaks and knows how to talk to young men. Now, if you're not a young man, if you're a wimp, I could understand not wanting to come to something like this. Okay, gentlemen, I'm inviting you to come. Or it's just like walking over 40 bucks and going your way. Now, if you have to work, if there's some other commitment, more pressing commitment, certainly we understand. But you can sign up right now. All we need is your name that you're gonna come. So, well, how can I do that? On your way over to your class, you can stop right at the Welcome Center here, the North Welcome Center. They are prepared right now to take sign-ups. As you leave, Vinny Tumia knows that you're gonna stop there and sign up. He's agreed to this. He wants you to come. He's trying to encourage you to come. Sometimes we just need a little bit of a push. There are many men in this church who are sacrificing many $40 right now, I, many of them, so you guys can come for free and have a good time. What is the money for? Pizza, wings, food. What teenage boy doesn't like pizza, <laughs> wings, and all of that stuff? Now, you can get any more information you might need right over there. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, you can be dismissed now. Our young people, our young men, our young ladies, stop by the Welcome Center and sign up. If you don't know what's going on, you can get a, an information sheet right there. It gives you all the information that you need to know. All right. Thank you, guys, and I hope that you will come. We do have to order the food and so we need to know if you're going to come. We just can't kind of guess at that, if you know what I mean. All right. <sighs> Good to see you. I'm, b I'm back. All right. Now, now that, I don't need any cheers, but let me, let me, I got a transition from the Lord's Supper to making an appeal to our young men. I really want our guys to come to our men's conference. I really do. Parents, would you encourage your kids? I know that some people are, have incurred difficult times financially, we're removing that barrier, that obstacle. We're taking that out of the way because it's all about this generation now. I don't want our kids to say, 40 bucks, where am I gonna get 40 bucks? And you know, I gotta ask my parents, we just started school, they bought me some clothes, they got this, that, and the other thing. I just can't go back to my parents. They don't have to do anything. We will pay for your young men, you, apply a little bit of pressure. Make sure that they can get a ride here, encourage them to come. Maybe there's something else that you were asking them to do. Could you let them out of that? Do it some other time to be here. It will be incredibly invaluable to your young men. A couple other things I need to say. I wasn't on vacation. I preached 14 times in 10 days, just so you know that. I was in a lot of different places. These were meetings 
weddings and things that had been scheduled a long, long time ago, and um, I had to fulfill my commitments. Prior to that, though, just so you know, I was here 27 Sundays in a row. I never even missed a sun Sunday all summer long for vacation. In fact, we did our Back to Church series uh, right through summer, and uh, every consecutive uh, Sunday of the summer we did that. Uh, I want to say something about Mike Metzger, though. Some of you know that Mike, um, and I won't go into the details, but Mike is in intensive care. I spoke with him yesterday. He's doing well. Uh, if everything goes well, he should get out of intensive care today, according to our conversation yesterday. But uh, he is doing better. He's got, uh, he's got some issues that he's dealing with. Some of you know he took a very serious fall about a month ago, and they dealt with what they could see on the outside. Unfortunately, they missed the fact that he had some internal bleeding on the other side of his brain, and that began to create some problems for him. They found those things. Uh, they um, had surgery on Friday. They re the neurosurgeon relieved the pressure and, and uh, said that everything went very, very well. But pray for Mike and Louise. And I know people have asked me this morning, it's easier to tell everybody all at once than give everybody uh, an account of that. But pray for Mike. He's a, he is a dear, dear brother. Tonight, some of us will not be here for a good reason. Vinny Tumia is going to be doing our evening service. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be in Naples. One of our men, one of our graduates from North Star Bible Institute, Tom Street, is going to be ordained this evening. So several of our people have been invited to participate, and I know several other people who are friends of his and the family. They will be going to Naples tonight. So uh, just... For your information, I'm not skipping out. I'm going, I'm going to be, I have to be in Naples at 3.30 this afternoon, and the service is at 5 o'clock this evening. So those are some things I just need to bring you up to date on, and I've been here all, all, all week long, and things are reasonably back to normal with the exception of the things that, of course, the challenges, the health challenges that people have and all that. But let's uh, kind of take a break from all that, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Would you join me, please? Father, I'm glad to be here. This is, this is home for me. I love First Bible Baptist Church. I love the people. That is what First Bible Baptist Church is all about. It's about the people. It's not the building. It's not the grounds. It's, it's not the hard surfaces. It's the people of First Bible. And I pray now, Lord, that you'll open our hearts. I want to have a little family talk with everybody here this morning. I want to bear my heart. And I ask for their respect and their attention. And I pray if there are those who get on the edge of topics like this, Lord, just help them to sit back, help them to relax, help them to listen and evaluate things as a Bible believer. We believe the Bible here. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. All right. Now you're wondering, what's he going to say today after that prayer? Well, you'll find out in a minute. But... Let's get our uh, program going here this morning. I don't know how we got to there already. Let's go to the beginning. My, uh, that, that's it, but Andy, could you take me to the slide with the architecture thing? Did you do that for me? I hope you did. That's why I had it printed up and I gave it to my secretary. I do not see that coming up, so there is a gaffe to start this morning. So we're going to get right into the message this morning, all right? We're going to do that. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Mark, if you would. Mark chapter number 7. Mark chapter number 7. Now, what I was going to show you is, and I'll just mention it, is all of the progress that we have made in the last four weeks since we cast the vision. M much of what we have done is internal. I call it vision architecture. That is, the things that you have to do uh, to begin to build your vision. We've got a list of about probably 12 to 14 things that have been accomplished thus far. If you're just kind of coming on Sunday morning and you're going, well, what's different? Well, you can see that's different for sure. But what else is different? There are many other things that are going on, groups, committees that are meeting on a regular basis because we're gonna, we want to take connect, grow, serve, and go to the next level. And there are groups meeting about each and every one of those things 
tying our whole church together to do the very best job that we possibly can do, certainly better than we have ever done before. The passage that we're reading from here this morning in Mark chapter 7 is one of the many confrontations that Jesus had with the Pharisees and the scribes. Remember, they were the religious leaders in hierarchy. They were the religious guides of the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was, frankly, spiritually bankrupt at the time of the coming of Christ. Christ came at a specific time, a purposeful time, because Israel had reached probably at the, at the lowest point spiritually in its history at the coming of Christ. The Bible says in chapter 7, verse 1, Then came together unto him, Jesus, the Pharisees, and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups, pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the traditions of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such things ye do. When he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable, and he saith unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entering or entereth into the man, it can't defile him? But be, because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out in the draft, purging all meats? And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murderers. By the way, we're all well acquainted with this, aren't we? We know that's the way men, uh, maybe I should say that's the way we are. Thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. By the way, this is not an indictment against the scribes and Pharisees. This is a statement of fact concerning mankind. This is what comes out of the heart of man. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Father, we are thankful for your word. Bless, uh, bless our time together. And again, give us humble hearts. Give us hearts that are willing to yield to you. Give us, Lord, pure hearts. Lord, we recognize that in and of ourselves that we have a tendency we have a tendency to be, to be evil, to be judgmental, to be prejudicial. Help us, Lord, we pray now today. In Jesus' name, amen. Every one of us in this room are prejudiced. You know, when people make statements like, well, you're prejudiced, aren't you? 
I never deny it. Of course I am. We are all prejudiced. In fact, you can't help but be prejudiced. Being prejudiced isn't the problem. Overcoming it is the problem. That's what the problem is. Because we are all, as individuals, have a tendency to make judgments, value judgments, on the basis of things that we see. And by the way, that's not a bad thing, because sometimes we look at a situation and we go, you know, this isn't good. Well, that's a good, that's a good way to use judgment. But sometimes we look at situations or we look at people and we make judgments based on what we see. The problem isn't being prejudiced or being presumptuous or being biased. We all are because of our experiences and backgrounds in life. The problem is overcoming it. The problem is seeing it for what it is, seeing our own evil eyes, our own evil hearts, our own tendency to be judgmental, our own arrogance and pride, and then dealing with that to overcome the judgment that we've made with reference to the other individual. There's gender prejudice. Some men very prejudiced against women, and I might say it goes the opposite way. Some women think men are idiots, and they're probably half right. Um, but the point is, we make judgments. We, have, uh, we make not only uh, gender judgments, biases, but we have age prejudices. We look at young people and we say, they're stupid. They really don't know what's going on. Someday they'll be smart as us. I've told you this many times. When I was young, 25 and under, in those years, particularly probably from the time I was 18 to 25, I could not understand anyone that disagreed with me. I thought anyone that disagreed with my assessments of any situation, the things I liked or the things I disliked, there was something wrong with them. Now, did somebody teach me or train me to be that way? No. That's the way you are. We are all given to be biased and prejudiced. We all make assumptions on the basis of appearances, visuals that we see. Now, it's not all a bad thing, as I said. Sometimes it keeps you out of trouble. Sometimes it helps you negotiate a difficult situation. But sometimes when we make judgments based on race, religion, gender, age, clothing that a person wears, culture, whatever it might, whenever we make judgments like that, oftentimes we can get ourselves in trouble. We have to be mature enough to be able to overcome that. Now, what's going on in the story that we have just read? I hope that you will take time, I will not right now, to read through the introduction in the bulletin. It's very, very important. It really lays a good foundation, and it will be something good for you to go back and read maybe this afternoon when you've got about five minutes to kind of refresh your mind what our message was all about this morning. The issue is this. The scribes and Pharisees come to Jesus and say, how come you don't do things the way we do things. How come your disciples, of course this is an indirect way of accusing Jesus, how come your disciples don't do what we do? Now, I want you to know the unwash and hand thing is purely a preference. It's not, uh, it's not something that's found in the Mosaic law. It's not one of the Ten Commandments. It's, it's none of those things. It was a tradition that the scribes and Pharisees had established over generations. It wasn't morality. It was preference. It was bias. It was prejudice. And like George Grace, when George Grace was a young man, they looked at someone who didn't do things the way they did them and said, there's something wrong with you when there really wasn't. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. 
Jesus is saying this. He goes beyond what I just said. He said, you make tradition equal to or even more important than the law. You can violate the law willingly and freely, but you want us to follow your expectations, prejudices, and biases for us. But you have no problem violating what the Bible says in relationship to your parents. And Jesus was absolutely correct. He said, you have made, you have made the word of God of none effect by your tradition. Your heart is so evil against these people because of your preferences, because of your traditions, because of your biases that you are willing to violate Scripture, Bible truth, on the basis of your preferences. Over the years, you know, I'm, I'm, I've met lots of, lots of very good and very noteworthy people. One of the most well-known Christians that I have ever met who's probably done as much or more, humanly speaking, than anyone that I know. So I, I want to build this person up before I tell you what that person said to me. And I'm just, I, I'm not going to tell you who it was. I don't want to besmirch the individual's reputation, but it shocked me when this individual said this. He said this. He said, Brother Grace, you know what's wrong with Christianity today? You know, of course, I'm, get, I'm getting ready for a jewel and a gem. This fella has an earned doctorate. He's the president of a university. He, is, he has taught thousands of young men in the ministry, highly recognized and revered, and rightly so. But he asked me that question. He said, you know what's wrong with Christianity? And I, you know, I don't know. I'm an idiot, you know, compared to this guy. This is what he said. He says, we don't have church on Sunday night at 6 o'clock anymore. And I thank God that we did when he said that. We did have church at 6 o'clock on Sunday night. But that's what he said to me. Is that what's wrong with Christianity today? By the way, there's nothing in the Bible about going to church on Sunday night at all. Or at any specific time. But in his mind's eye, that was a violation of the traditions that he had accumulated as a young man, as a young minister. Everybody had Sunday night service at 6 o'clock. And he noticed that churches were beginning to compromise the truth. It wasn't a truth. It was a preference. Now, you know what I learned from that? I learned that if a man is intelligent, is educated, is spiritual, is highly respected and revered in all of those things he deserved, if he can be wrong, anybody can be wrong. If he could be wrong, I can be wrong, you could be wrong, we could all be wrong. But what was wrong with what he said? He had elevated a personal preference or a tradition to make it equal to or even more important than many of the other things that he could have said. This is wrong. This is what is wrong with Christianity. Certainly, in my estimation, not going to church at 6 o'clock, going at 5 or 6.30 or 7.30 or whatever, that isn't the big problem that people have in churches. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to extrapolate, all right? If he can be wrong, so can you. And so can I. If he can be wrong, and I mean this, so can you. And you and I better make sure that when we make value judgments and moral statements that it's founded in the Bible and it's not your own personal preference, bias, or prejudice. I have to make sure of that. If I just tell you what I think or what I like, you know, I think blue is the best color. And I think anybody that drives a car other than a blue car is sinning. If I said that, you'd laugh at me. What if I really believe that? You say, Pastor, where's it in the Bible? I, I, that's what I believe. You'd say, he's an idiot. You wouldn't come to church here. 
Well, what are some of the things that you believe are absolute moral truths? Where are they substantiated in the Scripture? Now, what happens is this. The reason why I'm talking about the heart is that any of us can go wrong in this area. Before First Bible Baptist Church is ever going to realize this vision, we have to cleanse ourselves of our own personal preferences, biases, prejudices, assumptions, presumptions, and we have to deal with the facts of the Bible. Our children are watching us, and they wonder where we've come up with some of the wild ideas that we might have as a church when they look through the Bible and they don't find it in the Bible. Now, let me, let me start with something that's really simple that we can all understand, all right? This is my culture. They pinned a tie on me in kindergarten. Now, I'm not saying this to be unkind. Please don't be offended by what I say. Sit up, be an adult, and listen to what I have to say, okay? That's a blah, 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 blah. Let me tell you what I think. Biblically, there is nothing in the Bible that says I have to wear a tie to church on Sunday morning. Go ahead. I challenge all of you to give me a verse. Any verse in the Bible, anything in the Bible that says, Pastor Grace, or whoever stands behind this pulpit, has to wear a tie on Sunday morning. Where's that in the Bible? Let me ask you this. Did Jesus wear a tie? Did he wear a sport coat? Now, I know what you're thinking because I grew up in your, you're saying, well, if you're respectful, listen, I live in the presence of God all the time. I am to dress modestly all the time. I am to dress well, whatever that is to me culturally, all the time, except maybe when I'm underneath my car changing the oil or maybe run in a marathon, maybe I ought to take my tie off, whatever. I'm just simply saying this. I got a picture of a 1951 Yankees game, and it's a picture of the stands. There are no women there, none. You hear that, ladies? Ladies, no more. We're going to be traditional. No more women go to baseball games. All men sitting in the stands You'll have a tough time finding a lady at a baseball game 60 years ago. And all of the men are dressed in suits and ties and hats. They look like Humphrey Bogart, every one of them. If you, if you know, some of you don't even know who I'm talking about. Now, things have changed in the last 60 years. Anybody watch any of the Yankee games this week? Did you see Humphrey there? I mean, it's hard to find anybody that isn't in a T-shirt or shorts with beer spilled all over them. Now, I'm not saying that's good. I'm just simply saying what you see in that 1951 picture is a cultural thing. I grew up with that. You and I, uh, that are my age, we grew up in that culture. They slapped a tie on me in Catholic, Catholic kindergarten. And I've been wearing a tie ever since. By the way, I'm comfortable in a tie. But I know some people in our church, I know some young men that don't even own a tie. They don't have a suit. They don't have a reason to have one yet. Now they will. They'll need one when they get married, maybe. And they'll need one, maybe, when they get a job. To show up at the office, to apply for the job, they will wear a suit. Why? Because they respect God? No. No because they want a job. That's why they will show up in a suit. And they will hope that somebody will hire them because they dress a cut above the rest. So really, the motive is self-serving. It's not out of respect for the interviewer. It's not out of respect for the company. It's out of respect for my wallet. I want a job. Now let's think things through. We have kids in our church that don't dress like me. Notice, look at them this morning. And I'm not saying the ones that do shouldn't. That's up to them, just like it's up to you 
just like it's up to me. We've got to make sure that we don't make rules and regulations for people that are not biblical. What do we do? We're magnanimous. We're welcoming. We're open. We're not prejudiced because it's not a person's dress or where they live or how old they are or what gender they are or what color they are or what nationalistic background they're from that is important. Let me tell you what's important. Their soul. Yes. Amen. Their soul. Amen. Now, I'm not going to do something immoral to reach them, but I'm not going to ask them to conform to my culture to expel them. Do you understand the difference? You understand the difference? You say, well, you're not going to wear a tie anymore? No, I will. You know why? It's my culture. Not because I think God's going to be blessed if I wear a tie on Sunday morning. I got a lot of them. I got to use them up. Spend a lot of money on them. Help me, everybody. Not everybody in here is dressed alike, but you're all welcome. You're all welcome. 35 years ago, I went to a church as a visitor. I went to the door of the auditorium like we have, and there was a sign on the door. It said this, no pants in the auditorium. I looked down and I thought, okay. No, I didn't do that. It took me a couple seconds to look at that and go, what's the message here? Well, I know what it, the whole message wasn't on there. No women could wear pants in their auditorium. So if you walk into this church, lady, and you have pants on, take them off. Well, no, it wasn't saying that either. It was saying worse than that. It was saying, you are not welcome here. Because that's not our culture. Let's be careful. Let's be careful. Let's be careful that we don't push people away on the basis of cultural biases, prejudices, assumptions, presumptions. Let's be careful. Somebody walks in here, and surely there's somebody. There's probably lots of somebodies in here that have tattoos on them. Hey, when I was in the Marine Corps, half the Marines had tattoos. No one thought anything of it. But today, Christians look at somebody with a tattoo, and they go, he's got a tattoo. You know, he's probably, he's probably of the devil. I don't know. I kind of think they're pretty. Now, I don't have any. I don't have any. Some of them are pretty. Some of them are kind of ghoulish and all that. But pers personally, I'm not intimidated because somebody has a tattoo. I'm not, not going to wear one. That's me. It's my... See, I'm saying some things right now that w I will be misrepresented on. Somebody will say, pastor's for some. I'm not for. I'm not against it because I don't think there's anything inherently right or inherently wrong in it. Let's make sure that what we are saying, there is a biblical basis. Now, I'm not saying that people say some of these don't have a Scripture verse. I'm not saying that. But let's make sure that the Scripture verse is valid in the context with where it is found. Let me say some things. I'm, my time's almost over, and I haven't even started my sermon, but I'm going to do it really quickly. If we're going to reach the next generation, we're going to have to put aside some of our adult preferences, prejudices, assumptions, and biases. Because the kids, they're not as mature as we are. They look at us and they say, they assume, well, I'm not welcome here by the way I'm being treated, or by the way people look at me, or people don't embrace me, or whatever it is. We can't give kids the attitude that they're not welcome in this church because they look different. Some kid comes in with green hair, or his hair's, you know, he's six foot eight, he's really five six, but his hair is 14 inches high, or whatever it is. I don't care. That doesn't bother me. That doesn't bother me. Because I'm interested in his soul. Amen. Amen. I can get by the hair. 
I can get by the earring and the ear or the, the tattoo or whatever it is. People, I'm not telling you to get a tattoo. I'm not telling you to wear earrings, gentlemen. I'm not telling you. I'm not telling you to do I'm just simply saying we've got to accept people where they are. Where they are if we're going to reach them. We can't ask people to clean up their act before they can come to First Bible and be accepted. It isn't going to work. Jesus never did that. He never treated people that way. He was always interested in their souls. When we talk, <laughs> here's what I was looking for before. But that's all right. We'll move away. Thank you. We just won't do that now. Five statements on tradition. And that's my fault. I never talked to Andy. It's not his fault. There's nothing wrong with tradition. It's neither inherently good or bad. There's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing necessarily right with it either. It's my choice. It's my preference. Tradition should never be elevated to have equal status or authority with Scripture. We should never make something that isn't biblical make it biblical. No pants in the auditorium. I, I never got that out of the Bible. Now, I know people that will swear by that. I'm sorry. You better read the rest of the chapter. There's some interesting things in that chapter. You better practice if you're going to be consistent with that. Tradition should never trump Bible truth. Man's traditions can never violate truth. You can never make it more important than what the Bible says. If there's not biblical basis for a belief, at best it's merely a bias, a prejudice, or a preference. That's what traditions are made of. I'm not against tradition. I like Thanksgiving, turkey, I love it. Pumpkin pie. The Bible doesn't say you have to have turkey. If you have a ham, that's okay. You understand that? It's okay. I can't believe it. You're having ham on Thanksgiving. What's the matter with you? Because I like ham, that's all. Okay. I can live with that. See, now it's a tradition, and it's, a, it's fine. But not everybody has turkey on Thanksgiving in every country. It's a personal prejudice. It's a cultural thing in America. If one's heart is filled with bias, prejudice, and preference, truth will be neglected, violated, and ignored. I came out of probably the most traditional Christian faith practice, using the term very liberal, that you can come out of. I was immersed, indo indoctrinated, in tradition for 25 years as a parochial student, as a seminarian, as the nephew of a Catholic priest. My sister was a Catholic nun. My, ki my cousin was a Catholic missionary. Two other of my cousins went to the seminary to study the Bible. I was indoctrinated in tradition. It took me two years after I got saved to figure out what the Bible taught and what the church that I came out of taught to really determine the difference between the two. I was so immersed in tradition. Some of the traditions were very neutral. They were preferential. Some of the traditions violated Scripture. You don't follow tradition that violates Scripture. You have to be careful about that. Now, First Bible Baptist Church. I don't know how much time I have. I might have 15 more minutes and I drop dead, okay? Feeling pretty good, though, so don't worry about that. Right now, I feel pretty good. I don't know how long I will be here. Neither do you, by the way. My intention is to be here until God says get out. But we will have to go through a great transition for this generation now where I will feel comfortable that I can, whatever retirement is, and that doesn't mean that I will stop doing what I'm doing in the ministry. Whatever that means, the day will come when I know that's what I have to do. And you will all agree. Some of you were saying, you know, Pastor, you know, I think it's time to retire. Don't you think it's time to retire? You could, be, you could serve the church better maybe if you were cutting grass or something like that. And that day may come. It really might. It might be next week, as a matter of fact. But the church has got to be alive. This is a celebration we come to church. It can't be dead. Don't be upset if people get excited around here and sit there and, you know, I understand I came from quiet deadness. You can go to church in my old church and walk in and you could hear a pin drop for the whole service. You know why? Because half the people are sleeping, that's why, during the service. Love, not hate. 
You may not agree with somebody. You may not like their culture. You may not like their looks. You may not even like their behavior. But we're here to love people. We're here to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're not here to hate people. We don't want our kids to think that we hate them. Some of them do, people, because you treat them with a condescending attitude, like they're lower than you, lesser than you, like they're unimportant, like they're stupid. Love our children. Be forgiving, not condemning. Somebody walks in the door, they haven't been here in a while. Well, looky what the cat dragged in. Where you been? Oh, my, must be having problems in your life. You came back to God now to rescue you, huh? Oh boy, I'd want to come back to a church like that. Now most of you are very good. Very good. When you see somebody you haven't seen in a long time, your arms are open and you hug them and love them. But it only takes one. It only takes one person to be negative, to be sarcastic, to be judgmental and condemning. This is a true story, gentlemen. Gentlemen, I don't know who the men are. Two of our men arguing about the music in our church. Right there, two men in front of a new young man in the church. He said, Pastor Grace, I really like the church but I can't come to a church when your members are arguing with each other in the, inside the church service. I don't know who you are. God help you. That man, that young man is gone. He's gone. If you're going to discuss something, at least do it privately. Don't do it right in the middle aisle on Sunday morning. What's wrong with... You think there's anything wrong with that in the Bible? Is there anything in the Bible against sowing discord, arguing in the Sunday morning service with one another in the middle aisle? You think we could find something in the Bible that might suggest it's not a good idea? Amen. See, you want to make your tradition more important than the commandments in the Bible. Love one another. Forgiving, kind, peacemakers. Those are all things in the Bible. But you want to argue with one another in front of people you don't even know. What's the matter with you? God help you. Grow up. Truth, not tradition. Truth, not tradition. Tr tradition can be good. I love turkey on Thanksgiving. I, I love a lot of things about our church that aren't necessarily biblical. It's just the way we do it. But remember, it's the way we do it. It's not the Bible. It's the way we do it. Well, they went to this other church, you know, and they had three songs, and they had the offering before the announcements, Pastor. What do you think's wrong with them? I really don't care. I don't care what the order of their service is. I really don't care. Well, you know, I went to the church, and the pastor, he had one of them, their robes on. That's their business. I don't care. Remember D Dr. Kennedy, D. James Kennedy? How many of you remember Dr. Kennedy? Great. He always wore a robe when he preached. Got a problem with that? Am I going to wear a robe? No. Am I going to take my tie off? Probably not. It isn't important. Dr. Kennedy was concerned about souls. Souls. I respected the man for his love for people and for souls. I don't care what he wore on the pulpit. I don't care if the choir has robes on or if they're all dressed in, you know, jumpsuits or whatever. I don't care. What difference does it make to you? What's the problem? We're talking about people. People. We need freedom, not bondage. We don't want people to come in here and experience the bondage of FBBC. Well, if you're going to be here, you're going to have to do this, 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 and 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 this. And then, then you'll have to go in front of the membership committee, and we'll have to, you know, we'll have to get your police record. Net. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. It's freedom. Christ has made me free. I'm not in bondage. I was in bondage when I practiced my other religion all my life. I felt in bondage. I felt constrained. I felt restricted. I felt like people were always looking at me like that. God help us not to give our young people that kind of an impression at First Bible Baptist. Accept them. Don't reject them. 
I want our young men to go to our men's conference. Come. We want the best for you, not the worst for you. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to criticize you. I'm not going to look at your clothing or your hairstyle. And ca- I'm not going to do that. I'm concerned about your soul. That's what this is all about. God help us, people. Because you want something your way, and you'll drive people away from Christ because of your own personal preference. We want people to serve God out of desire, not out of duty. Now, there is a duty certainly attached to Christianity, but I want you to want to come here. I want the kids to want to come here. I don't want them to get up on Sunday morning and go, oh, oh we got to go to verse by the way. I want them to come because they want to come because it's the one of the best experiences of their weeks when they walk in the door here because of the way you and I treat them and love them that's what I want we're into transforming people not modifying behavior that's what Christ does he changes us he takes away our biases our prejudices our hatred our sarcasm our criticisms And we look at people and we forgive and we love and we accept. I may not accept somebody's bad, evil behavior, but I love the person for Jesus' sake. God, help us. Authentic Christianity, not Pharisaical hippo. Well, you know, your brother, they don't wash their hands the way we wash their hands. What's wrong with them, Jesus? Where's that in the Bible? They were, they were, spiritual, educated, high-profile individuals. And they were totally wrong. They missed it. How could people so educated, so supposedly spiritual, leadership-quality people, how could they be so wrong and say, Jesus, how come they don't wash their hands the way we do? That was important to them. God chose to record that incident in the Bible so you and I would see how stupid we can be sometimes. Me! Everybody should be the way I'm, I am. It's the way I was as a young man. I didn't get over that when I turned 25 either. It took a long time for me to get over that. I'm over it. I'm over it. I don't look at people's appearances. I don't look at their clothing. I don't look at their hairstyle. I don't look at the externals. I look at their soul for Jesus' sake. We're here to win people to Christ. Then let Jesus transform them. That's what happened to me. I was a drinker. I'd probably be a dead alcoholic right now if I didn't get saved. Let me tell you something. No one, no one in this church came up to me and said, you better put that alcohol away. That's evil. That's immoral. You're horrible. You better stop doing that. You know who taught me to, not to drink anymore? God. Amen. The Holy Spirit did. I was sitting reading my New Testament with a can of Jenny Cream Ale. A New Testament in one hand. My two favorite things, Cream Ale in my right hand. Yeah, where they, they were my two favorite things, other than my wife, of course. And I sat there and I went, you know, these two things just don't go together. Now, I'm not going to go into why that all happened. I'm just telling you the end result. And I went in the kitchen, and I took my cream ale, and I dumped it down the drain. And I went to my expensive liquor cabinet with my Chavez Regal, my VO, my, oh, what was that? Oh, man, I didn't have them to drink. I had them to impress people. That's what I had them for. They were like trophies on my mantle. Southern comfort. That was it. Oh, boy, did that make me sick when I drank it. And I went to that, and I went to the kitchen, and I dumped it down the drain. Let me tell you what. I'm not telling you to do that. You do whatever you want to do. Let God talk to you. I'm telling you who told me. God will transform people. If they're truly saved and we truly love their souls and they get in the Word of God, God will change people's hearts. I hope He changes yours. Amen. We stop judging people on, the, on appearances, authentic. It's a people, not place. Let me just say this. I really don't care what you think right now, by the way. I got enough money. 
I'm on Social Security. I'm okay, all right? So, I'm not here because I need a paycheck. I'm not. My house is paid for. My kids are grown up. I got Social Security. My goodness, I'm living like Bernie Madoff, except the jail part. I'm not there. People, people, lot place. People. Brother Grace, I saw somebody bring coffee into the auditorium. I, no, hang on. It was a rule not to do that. It was a rule not to do that. You had to make a value judgment. Culture has changed. People are a little different. By the way, that could go either way. I could say no or yes and wouldn't violate anything in the Bible. I wouldn't. It's okay. I could go either way. But you know what? I want visitors to feel welcome. Amen. So you bring a cup of coffee in here, a drink, just put a top on it so you don't spill it in the last row and it runs all the way down to the front. <laughs> That's the only thing. You say, Pastor, I don't play. That was the reason why I did it. I'm concerned about people, not the place. Amen. I'm not being disrespectful to $16 million people, but I'm being very respectful to the people who walk in the door. I don't want people to have a reason not to come back or not to sit and listen to what's going on from that pulpit. I don't want that to happen. We're talking about relationships. This isn't religion, people. This is relationships with God and people. That's what it's all about. Compassion. Loving people, not condescension. Not looking down at people and going, well, one of these days you'll figure out you'll be as good as we are someday. But right now we'll forgive you for being an idiot. No, no. I love kids. I love our children. I want our children to feel like when they walk in the door at First Bible Baptist Church that this is like going to Chuck E. Cheese or Adventure Landing or something like that. I really do. You don't think it could... I didn't say we have to put on all the entertainment for them. I want them to feel good about being here. I want them to feel safe about being here. I want them to feel like people love them while they're here. That's what I want. And you know what? They'll stay and they'll come back when they're 18, 19, 24, 26. Because it's always been a good place to be. Not a bunch of old 66-year-old guy stay in the corner looking at the kids walking by going. Shaw, 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 shaw. Kids are pretty quick. They yeah, they're dumb. But they pick up quick, very quickly on people who are critical of them. They see the condescending attitudes and the criticism, the judgmentalism. <sighs> Heart's got to change, people. I'm sticking my neck out. You want to argue about, about this with me? I've said in the past, I want to argue about it. I'll tell you right now, I'll argue about it. I'm fighting for what I'm talking about. I'm fighting for this. I'm fighting for the, kid, the souls of our kids. I'm not going to let you come in here and be a Pharisee or a scribe. You're welcome to stay. But you will meet resistance. I'm not going to tell you it's okay. It's not okay. We want to reach people. We want to reach our kids, our children, our young people in our community, and young adults, young marrieds. I don't want something to be between me and them because I got some tradition or something that's really important to me, and it's okay. It's important to me. But it's not important to them. And I'm not going to make them or force them to make important to them just because it's a tradition that's important to me. Like it? I don't know. I say everything I'm saying here fervently and with compassion. Everybody comes to the end of a journey in life. I'm not going to depart from this place with people thinking it's all right to be snobbish, arrogant, Amen. biased. Amen. Those hippie kids, Amen. those little brats. I'm not going to allow it. I'm not going to allow it. If you don't love kids, you're in the wrong place. If you don't love this generation now, you're in the wrong place, people. Amen. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. It's not going to happen. 
they're all going to feel like Pastor Grace loves them. Our young men, we love our young men. We want our young men to go to the men's conference. I'll pay your way to go. I want you to go. I want you to be helped. I want you to be better. I want the best for you. I want the best for this generation. Now, right now. Lord, help us. Thank you, Lord. I, I didn't follow my notes very well, but I did say what's on my heart. Lord, I ask for your help for our church. It's a good church, but we could be better for your honor and for your glory. It's a good church, a really good church. There's lots of good people. There's lots of people in here that understand everything that I said and agree with it. But then some of us need to make some adjustments in our thinking. We need to look at our hearts. We need to ask ourselves, am I being prejudicial? Am I biased? Do I despise people based on an appearance, the color of their skin, their age, their gender, their hairstyle, the clothes they wear? Am I prejudiced because of something I see that really has little or no value whatsoever when it comes to morality and spiritual things? God, help me to look past that to the soul of a young man, a young woman, an old man, an old woman, whoever, that needs the love of God in his life. We're here to bring help, healing, and hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me? I've gone way too long here this morning. The invitation goes on all week long. You're not gonna make the decision right here to change. We need to change. I want you to think about what I've said all week. Would you take the bulletin and read the article that I wrote in the beginning. It will be a real help to you. One verse, we pray, we're done. Brother Jim, you make your way here, so I will keep my promise. Dave, one verse, and we're gone. Jesus said, let the children come. Yet we don't see we're standing in the way. In a thousand ways we show we don't believe Louder than words Oh, faithless generation To turn your head as they go astray Will you stand aside as they walk away? They must see power, know His grace, find His mercy in this place. They must feel His love and know it's true, that Jesus lives in you. who are planning to come to Men's Conference but you haven't signed up, we'd really ask strongly that you'd sign up today at the North Welcome Center. Um, it helps the team plan to make sure there's enough food for everybody. And one last thing, I would suspect men that in our sphere of influence there's probably a handful or more of younger men that we could potentially invite to Men's Conference. I encourage you to reach out to those guys because they don't have to pay, and I think it might be life-changing for them, all right? And with that, you are dismissed.